This video serves as part 2 in our series of recreating the Roman battle model. If you haven't already, check out part 1 so you're up to date with the events until this point. After going over these stages of pre-battle, moving into formation, approaching the enemy, and making contact, we can finally focus on the juicy topic of the battle itself. Previously, I explained the phenomena of people wanting to stick together in the chaos of battle, but it doesn't mean they did this to the extreme of fighting shoulder to shoulder and back to shield. This model, known as Othysmos, has been popular for Greek hoplites and Macedonian phalanxes, implying that entire units would push and shove each other in battle until one side broke, with the depth of ranks playing a key role. But even though Roman sources often speak of armies pushing each other back, this is likely meant metaphorically. We can prove this by the very design of the Roman shield, which had a protruding metal boss, a horizontal grip, and was not fastened at the elbow like the Greek aspis shield so we know for sure it was not designed to push with. We also have written evidence against the use of tight formations, like Caesar at the Battle of the Sabbath when he noticed that the 12th Legion was too hard-pressed, and ordered them to loosen their formation so they could use their swords more effectively. Lastly, if battles were indeed fought in relatively tight formations, there would be little need for individual skill in combat, as it would be the unit's overall cohesion that would win battles. However, we know for sure that Romans, Gauls, and Iberians had a large cultural emphasis on skilled swordsmanship, which proves that men in battle must have had enough space to fight the enemy one-on-one. -on -one. So it's safe to say they held about three feet, or one meter, between themselves, at least during the mid to late Republican period, which is confirmed by Polybius. Only the front line would overextend a larger distance to have enough space to comfortably fight, before retreating back to the safety zone provided by the mass. In the last video, I explained that front rankers use far more of their shields than their swords, which makes such breakaways very easy to imagine, as their enemy is not constantly pressing them. This model also goes along with our second point, introduced in the previous video, as it allows entire sections of the army to move large distances. If a century is being pushed back, the unit behind them could comfortably take some steps back, without knocking each other over or compromising any space. But the most useful part of this model is that it keeps the majority of units outside the moral tension zone at all times, thus engaging only those necessary and keeping the rest away from extreme mental strain. Let's not forget that those inside the combat zone would be looking their enemy in the eye and fearing death at any moment. Their hearts would be pounding, their bodies sweating and shaking with adrenaline. This is not a condition the body could endure for long, and those behind them would be free from these extremes of mental exhaustion, even though the stresses of dodging missiles and being the next one to fight are always present. This model may be hard to take in at first, but is surprisingly common in many human conflicts, and can be seen in standoffs between rioting mobs and police, or in any boxing match, where all parties are approaching each other with caution, only striking when opportunity presents itself, and then retreating to a safety zone, instead of lashing out continuous blows without rest. Thus, much of the battle would be spent staring each other down and unleashing missiles and insults, until one side worked up the courage to charge again. We can now more easily imagine such battles lasting several hours if need be, until one side eventually breaks from the continuous charges, flying missiles, or mental exhaustion. This dynamic standoff model seems the most reasonable with our limited sources, with some of them even starting to make sense. Livy, for example, records a battle in 310 BC in which the Etruscans purposely threw away their missiles to motivate themselves to fight with swords. But this made it difficult for them to even approach the Romans, who were continuously throwing javelins and rocks without fearing enemy projectiles, before launching their own charge against the now disordered formations. But if the depth of ranks does not increase the strength or force of a unit, then what was the point of it? It was primarily to replace tired units, as it would only take minutes until the front line of both sides would get exhausted, and they would ultimately have to disengage to either catch their breath or replace the tired and wounded. Another purpose of deeper ranks was to guard the flanks, and we can now see why flanking charges were so devastating throughout history, not only because of the psychological shock, but also in forcing the ranks to squeeze together and denying them of a safety zone to retreat to. This greatly hinders a unit's cohesion and ability to use their weapons effectively, 
which results in chaos, panic, and claustrophobia, and was enough to break most formations and subject themselves to a slaughtering, which is what happened to the Romans at the Battle of Cannae. Furthermore, space needed to be kept between centuries to not intermingle the men and to allow access for commanders, messengers carrying orders, or even routing men to pass through. After all, frightened men could knock over those behind them and break formations, and are as dangerous as the actual enemy in this state. Having gaps between units was also an effective way to prevent the spread of panic through the ranks, which could otherwise consume the whole army in a very short amount of time. It is often assumed that barbarian armies came in disorganized battle lines, but most of them had their own formations and battle dynamics to match the Romans. The Gauls, for example, had each of their chieftains lead their personal retinues into battle, known as Ambakti, consisting of up to a couple hundred men at best, which would likely also have space between them for the same reasons the Romans did. Likewise, the importance of charges as being the decisive factor in winning battles was also very well known to them, and it was even engraved in their warrior culture that Gallic nobility should be the first to enter battle, so the most skilled, experienced, and well-equipped warriors were placed in the front ranks to both deliver and absorb the most frightening of charges, and countless other ancient armies followed this example. Before we carry on, a quick word from our sponsor, Atlas VPN. It's an easy-to-use software with a clean display that can make the internet accessible and secure for anyone. Atlas VPN allows you to easily change your IP address to get real and organic search results when browsing the web, ensuring that no one can track your activity or private information. What's more is you can use it to unlock content on Netflix or other streaming software that is otherwise geo-locked to another location. Simply select the country you want to access, click connect, and you're all set. You can now enjoy access to new content on streaming services, and even local prices for online shopping. Atlas VPN also comes with an inbuilt system for blocking ads and malware. And with just one Atlas VPN subscription, you can protect an unlimited amount of devices, and ensure you're always safe from data trackers and malware, while also enjoying the full extent of the internet. Atlas VPN also has the best deal on the market, so make sure to take full advantage of their limited summer deal. For just $1.83 per month, you can get all these benefits plus 3 months extra. Click the link in the description to sign up today. Regarding the Roman command structure, there is, interestingly, no definitive evidence for there being a commander of each cohort during battle. According to modern scholars, the six centuries that made up each cohort operated individually throughout the battle and the 80 men within each century were able to achieve this flexibility thanks to three officers. The Centurion, who acted as the unit's commander, would lead and inspire the men from the front. Due to psychological factors, it wasn't the missiles but the charges that played the decisive role in routing the enemy and spreading panic, which is testament to how important the Centurions were. Modern studies have proven that the more aggressive and respected a Centurion was, the more likely his century was to rout the enemy in front of them as his men will feel more confident and courageous in his presence, which is far more terrifying to the enemy. In fact, it is the precise quality of aggression that the Romans prized above all others in their centurions, with even Caesar saying that armies that see aggressive centurions as a role model are more likely to be victorious. Unsurprisingly though, centurions had a high mortality rate. The next key officer was the Optio, the second in command of the centurion, who would stand in the back row to dissuade the unit from deserting and encourage them to fight on. The last important officer was the Signifer, whose key qualities were bravery and courage, as he stood in the middle and held the unit's proud standard up high. If the unit was a cell, he was the nucleus, who the men could easily spot and rally to in the chaos of battle. Thanks to these three officers, Roman centuries were able to operate like an amoeboid cell, capable of altering its size, advancing, and falling back as it saw fit. The discipline and small size of these units gave the Romans a key advantage over many of their opponents, as they were able to launch more frequent and coordinated charges at the enemy, as opposed to less disciplined barbarians, of which only a few brave men would step up to lead charges. Supporting this model are Livy's references to battles consisting of repeated charges and steady attacks and withdrawals. We can also imagine the famous Roman checkerboard formation working here, as the enemy will be drawn to attack the overextended centuries, while only exchanging missiles with those behind. Most wouldn't dare abuse the gaps, 
as that would expose their flanks to enemy missiles and charges on all sides, and risk being squeezed in and swiftly slaughtered. So this formation not only created a trap for the enemy, but also a system of continuous random waves of charges against the enemy, as well as providing a way to make a steady and cautious withdrawal for heavily exhausted or wounded centuries. In this way, we have satisfied our third point of replacing tired men. In his commentary, Caesar even mentions fresh cohorts replacing tired ones at Alerta, so perhaps these mechanics could work on a larger scale too, but we can't be sure. Overall, battles were as diverse as the surrounding terrain and the people fighting them, so depending on these, Roman armies would use different formations and tactics, and they would have to adapt to any exceptions to our general battle model. For example, if their enemy finds a way to expose the gaps in the checkerboard formation, they could plug the holes and fight as a single battle line. When fighting cavalry, they could tighten the formations and use their javelins as spears instead of projectiles. And if their enemy had larger units, the centurions behind could perhaps send their optios with several men to bolster the size of those in front. You could see how disciplined and flexible subunits gave the Romans a significant advantage over many of their foes. Last but not least, it is important to understand what to do when the enemy breaks. Vegetius warns to never overextend in a rout, as at any moment the enemy could rally, form a line, and counter the now disorganized pursuers, and the exact reverse could occur. Some battles are known to have been lost in this way. A highly disciplined and experienced army will know not to make such a mistake, and to send the cavalry and light infantry forward instead. These troops are perfect in these situations as their speed adds even more panic to fleeing units. And even if the enemy does rally, they can quickly fall back and let the infantry take over once again. I hope you enjoyed this deep dive into Roman combat, but there is still much more we have to cover, like cavalry combat, hoplite warfare, and field strategies and maneuvers. So consider subscribing and clicking the bell icon to stay updated. I would like to express my deepest gratitude to our loyal and generous patrons for helping us make this video. As always, I hope to see you all in the next one.